Hi, we're twin brothers. <laughs> we are indeed, and welcome to Pockets Full of Soup. We are. This is a little uncanny. This is a little weird. You're better looking than I am. Oh, thank you. I'll I, take it. You have a more defined facial structure. You've oh. obviously taken better care of yourself. That's not saying... I mean, I, I don't take that good care of myself, but thank you. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mike Drucker, our guest this week on Pockets Full of Soup. I'm your host, Jared Petty. Mike, you've done amazing things. Thank you. That's very nice of you. Uh, can you tell the, the good people at home a little bit about what you what you do vocationally? Yeah. Uh, I am currently a writer on the show Adam Ruins Everything on True TV. I'm also the uh, co-head writer of the Netflix show Bill Nye Saves the World. Uh, before that, I wrote for The Tonight Show starring Jimmy Fallon. Before that, Late Night with Jimmy Fallon. Before that, I was at IGN. Before that, I was a localization editor at Nintendo of America. And before that, I was an assistant at Saturday Night Live. I figured that somewhere in there, there would be like uh, also like Lawrence of Arabia style gorilla or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, did any of that ever happen? I was or? also in the Foreign Legion. You I and was... Peter O'Toole fighting side by side? Yeah. Or? I'm okay. also a Vietnam War veteran. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. Well, I look young, but I did it. Okay. Well, goodness. You, you get in there on 73, <laughs> 74 right at the end. Yeah. You know, just, just slip in under the radar. <laughs> America's youngest soldier, um, but yeah, uh, Mike Drucker, and you're here in uh, you're here in San Francisco because you're doing Sketchfest. That's right, I'm here for SF Sketchfest. So you're going to do stand up? I'm doing stand up tonight at Cobb's. I'm featuring, uh, and then tomorrow night I'm doing a recording for the streaming service CISO on a show called The Guest List. And there's a lot of good people on that, like Derek Sheen, Emily Blotnick, uh, Emmy Blotnick. Sorry, Emmy Blotnick. Uh, really good people. Will this uh, will this go up uh, uh, for? streaming like afterward are you going to be able to watch it in an archive or is it only live uh no it'll be streaming afterwards okay good so you'll be able to see it then. yeah oh that's lovely i can't wait yeah it'll uh, be fun yeah i saw you do stand up at uh, kind of funny live yeah uh, a lot of the same audience for these shows a lot of overlap there so a good number of the people watching this may very well have been in the room that oh night. neat thank but, you guys uh, for watching you were good that night so that was that was super fun those good those dudes those kind of funny dudes are like so they're so fun and they know their community so well and they're so caring about their community. So that was such a like an such an easy show to do. Like yeah. sometimes you're like, all right, well, okay, so I like video games and what here's what a video game is. Okay, so you have a television and then you plug in like and, like with kind of funny. I'm like, so Castlevania and everyone's like, we're on board. Yeah, everybody, it, you, you're right there. You've got the context but right, right exactly. In. So you've done amazing things here. I thank you so much for agreeing to be on the show. This was kind of put together at the last minute. So Mike, uh, I, we're going to jump right in here uh, with the first question that we always ask. Uh, tell me about somebody you're thankful for. I, uh, you, when you told me to do this, you gave me, you, you asked me to think of somebody and I was like, oh, okay. And I have a lot of people I'm thankful for. I have a lot of people, just to preface this, I have like a lot of people who I'm very lucky to have met at the right time in my career. Um, you know, I would not be where I am today with a lot of people who helped me out at the right time, who like taught me how to work hard at what I do without working stupidly at what I do. Um, but the person I thought of that I kept coming back to is a guy named Mitchell Comiskey, who was my sixth grade science teacher. Whoa. And uh, what I liked about Mitch Comiskey was that he was – he taught me that you can be funny even when it's not time to be funny. This is what your science teacher taught That's you. what my science teacher taught me. He was super funny. He was he – was, he brought so much humor into lessons – and and that's part of the reason why I like doing stuff like Adam Ruins Everything and the Bill Nye Show is because I'm like, oh, like you can you can use humor to help people. That's why I like shows like John Oliver or Seth Meyers' show. Like, you can you can use humor to teach. Okay. And he did that so well, and he was such like a friendly person that like you know me and other students would like hang out with him during lunch breaks, and like you know like he like brought his kids to school. His kids were like babies, and like you know like we knew his family. He'd bring his wife, and like he made us feel like it wasn't like. It wasn't your usual teacher where he's just teaching, you know, you, you get to the test, you pass, he moves on. He was somebody who created a community within his classroom. No, that's interesting. You, you talked about two things, humor and community. How, the, how are those two things related when it comes to teaching? Um, well, when it comes to teaching, because it makes you engaged. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it doesn't feel like you're going to a day job. I think, you know, for a lot of us, when you're kids, school is your day job. Okay. And it's somewhat supposed to be your job is supposed to be to learn so you learn how to get a real job later <laughs> um but you know the best jobs are the ones you enjoy doing and he was you know other teachers had been fun or they'd been like cool or they'd make jokes and you'd laugh but he was the first teacher where i was like oh like i want to be in this classroom you know i'm you know excited to come to to to, to this period of school you know um, Wait, what's let's let's talk about yeah. sixth grade Mike Drucker. First. Yeah, where are you at this? Point? I am in. I am in. Uh, I went to Parkway Middle School, which was in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Oh, Fort Lauderdale. Okay. Yeah. So I lived in Florida and Melbourne and Orlando at various times. Right, right, right. Uh, and and I've heard you talk uh, in a couple of places about the uh, the joys, the of, joys of, of Florida life in uh, in Florida. You're on East Coast of Florida there in yeah. Fort Lauderdale. Um, so Fort Lauderdale around what year? Uh, oh boy. Um, let me see. <sighs> 
I almost have to like work crew. backward. <laughs> Days of yore. Okay. Uh, let's say I graduated in 2012. So I want to say like 1996. Okay. So, so I'm about- like subtracting six from 12, which is probably incorrect somehow. Okay. So you're a mid 90s. Mid 90s. Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. You're all of what? It's sixth grade, about 11, 12 years old, somewhere yeah. around there. Yeah. Okay. What's What's Mike Drucker like? At this point, really sad. Really, I think I was I was a goth kid. Um, I oh. wasn't. I couldn't afford. I couldn't afford like all the the, um, like the outfit and gear. But like spiritually, I was a goth kid. Oh, okay. Wait, wait that's even better. You yeah, were, you were goth on the inside. I was goth on the counts. inside. Like I hung out with other goth kids who had, you know, I didn't go to a very r- rich school, and my parents, especially during this period, didn't have a lot of money. Okay. So like my friends would be like the full on, you know, like chain wallet, makeup, band T shirt, like hundreds of dollars of like sadness around them and i would just wear like dark clothes and try to fit in that way but you know somehow i think that's even more authentic if yeah. you don't even have the money to be sad about not having money to be yeah. sad that that's that's even better it's even sadder <laughs> did, did you have any uh fingernail polish um no uh i did you use I, a sharpie I used a Sharpie. <laughs> I definitely used a Sharpie a couple times. I never did fingernail polish. Whenever I'd do it, like, my hands naturally shake a bit. Oh. So I'd always, like, sort of stain the cuticles and, like, get it off. Why do your hands shake? I have no idea. I've always, when I was a little kid, I wanted to be a ma- magician. And I remember, like, I'd do, try to do tricks and my hands would just shake too much to do them. It's not, like, horrible or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and I went to a doctor once when I was a little, not a little kid, but, like, around this time. I was like, yeah, my hands shake. And he's like, eh, it's probably not a big deal, so I wouldn't worry about it. Wow. Which, it could be a big deal, and he was just a bad doctor. Yeah, it's possible. It's just right. like, yeah, it's, I don't want to fool with this right now. Kid will be fine. Right. But sometimes I'll be on stage doing stand-up, and I'll hold the mic, and it'll naturally shake. It might, I mean... This is a little bit weighted, and I'm not moving that much, but like with stand-up especially, you're moving a lot, and my hand will shake, and people will be like, you are so nervous up there. And I always feel bad because it comes off as nerves when in reality I'm just like a very shaky person. So it, it, when it comes to being on stage, are you normally pretty cool and collected? Um, I'm usually my, – my personality on stage is a little more like bouncy, so I'm a little bit like, ah, or like, hey, and I address things and I move quickly. But it's not nervous or anxious. Okay. So going back to your youth, yeah. uh, same, you're, you're sad. Yeah. What are you sad about? Um, I was I was a really overweight kid, uh, like much more so than I am now. I think I like you know when I was maybe not sixth grade, but definitely seventh and eighth grade, I was heavier than I am now. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was a super heavy kid. So heavier pound for pound, pound for pound, okay. pound for pound, and shorter. Um, I was heavier. I was I think I like kind of hit puberty pretty early in life, so I liked girls really early on. But because I was heavy, and because I like had the low self esteem from the heaviness, I didn't date for a long time. But I really wanted to. But mm-hmm. this was like. Like I hit puberty like when girls do younger, okay. and I was like, and I was like, ah, oh, I like girls, and I want to date somebody, but nobody wants to date me. And I think I was also like, because I was so desperate, it had a creepiness to it, which made me sadder because I wasn't as self-aware. Okay, I sort of um, thought, you know, if I'm sad or brooding, that's that's deep, and it isn't always. No, it isn't always, but it can be. It can but, be. But it can it be. But, but when you're in sixth grade, it's not. Well, that's it. When you're there, the, the, I think people forget this. The, yeah. the context of, of, you know, we can look at teenagers' problems or middle right. school or even children's problems and look at the complexity and the pain of our lives right. and go, what is wrong with them? What are they so upset about? But that's their whole life. That's, that's their, their whole entire life. context. Their of course whole they're life. upset. Yeah. yeah. It, it's very real and very big Yeah. So uh, when you're there. So I think I was really lonely. I think I was, you know, I wasn't happy with my body. Um, My parents were going through a hard time financially. So I think that there was just a lot of different elements in my life from a bunch of different angles that made me uh, like a sad person. Do you have any close friends? I did, but I had a tendency to, and I still do. It's a problem I have now, which is like I'm always close friends with like a person at work or someone in like that grade. And then like when I move on, I don't keep that connection. I'm very bad at that. Um, which is something I'm like trying to work on in my life still. Well, you seem to be doing. I mean, you've you've dropped in. You've uh, seen the kind of funny guys yeah. while you're here in town. You've seen the comedy button guys while you're here in town. Are you making any purely social calls while you're here? Um, I hung out with Greg. I hung out with Greg go. with, but it wasn't like a kind of funny video. Although I'm probably going to do something tomorrow morning. Yeah. But I mean, like last night when I ha- hung out with Greg Miller, it was just like, oh, let's get dinner, and I was like, oh yeah, let's get dinner. Yeah. I think sometimes even as an adult, I have this weird. Um, even though I'm Catholic, this very Protestant work ethic thing where I'm like, like, well, if I'm hanging out with somebody, it should be for a reason. It should yeah. be for industry, you know, like, and that's such a bad way to live your life. But it's trapped in my head. Yeah. When you when the intersection of like Norwegian Calvinism. Yeah. And, and then like uh, the oppression of, of Protestants in England, which led right. them into the industrial class, which is the only place they could get jobs. And right. you combine those factors in the United States, possibly the world's most capitalist cutthroat country. Right. 
people from a Protestant background sometimes have a really hard right. time justifying enjoying anything. I, I come from that tradition. And right. let me tell you what, like like that uh, that kind of becoming a Quaker, yeah. that was helpful. It's like, it's all right, man. That's cool. Breathe. It's, it's okay. cool. It's okay. It's cool. But so right. in, it was kind of hard to, to justify even that, you feel yeah. like? Yeah, um, you know, it just, I just, uh, it's not that I couldn't make friends, it's just that I would have one or two really close friends, and then, like, you'd go to a different grade, and I also did something in, uh, that a few public school districts do, but it's something called a magnet school, Yeah, which is, I'd go to a school that was a little bit far from my home, because I had a special program. At the time, uh, both middle school and high school, I went for computers, because I thought I was going to become a computer programmer, I was going to go make video games. Um, That was, like, my original plan. And so, you know, I wasn't in my neighborhood, so I didn't know the kids in my neighborhood because uh, I wasn't going to school yep. with them. Um, and my parents, because of financial trouble, we moved out of, like, the neighborhood that all my elementary school friends lived in. So in middle school, I didn't know any of the people who were my age in my neighborhood. And my school was far away, so all of my friends were only at school. And nobody had a car when you're 12. So there was a lot of isolation in my life. That makes, uh, so this, so you have this isolation. You're cut off from a lot of people. Your parents are in a financial difficulty. Yeah. You're you're overweight and feel uh, a sense of yeah. of self awareness around that. Yeah. You come into the sixth grade. Yeah. And here's the science teacher. So uh, let me, let's get the first impression. What was the first thing that gave you an idea that this guy was going to be different? I you know I don't know what the first thing is, but I remember specific moments. You know, like I would read books a lot in class um, because I would get like bored and I'd start reading and it, I don't know if it was me rebelling or me just thinking like oh reading's fine so I can take out a book and read in the middle of class and it's fine like something I just wasn't aware of socially but I'd do that and one time I was reading like and I was like when I was in like the sixth grade I thought I was this advanced kid so I'd read like books that dumb adults read so I'd read like you know like sexy thrillers but like Ooh. you know like i'd read like like bodice rippers yeah or like, like like tom clancy or michael ah, crichton books okay. which like you know you can blow through in a day as an adult but when you're like 12 you're like this is what adults read exactly um, clear and present danger and think I, about it exactly and i was reading disclosure <laughs> which is like i don't know if you've seen the movie disclosure <laughs> I know what you're talking about and i was reading and i remember like it was like my, he grabbed the book out of my hand. He's like, you st- you stop reading my class. And then he like flipped to a random page and started reading a sex scene to the class like in this way that was very funny. It wasn't creepy. And th- I think what was cool about him was he wasn't like – when you're in elementary school and a teacher's funny, it's almost like a, a clown, almost like, hey, oh, I'm like the bouncy one. Or like, ah, look, I took a tumble. Like, you know, like, and he spoke to us like we were adults. Ah. So all of his jokes weren't – they weren't like creepy sex jokes, but they were like – adult level jokes where you're like yeah that's what i'm 12 i'm an adult like i'm thinking that way he was approaching you in a way that that made him made you aware that he was aware that you needed intellectual equality exactly Is that it? Or, exactly okay. right. that's, okay. that's I'm a, sure i understood that that's an amazing way to put that oh actually i thought it was very awkward and used way too many <laughs> words but thank you that's kind of it uh i appreciate that uh so he, he was yeah i remember i had a teacher in the uh at seventh grade or so who was eating a peppermint patty and jumped up on top of the air conditioning unit and right. started doing the York peppermint patty sensation commercial. Yeah. And I couldn't decide if it was brilliant or desperate. Right. Um, this, this sounds different. To this me. is different. Like for yeah. ex- like one time, like we had, this was, I think right at the dawn of like PowerPoint. So all of our science for presentations oh. were done in PowerPoint whoa. and we were like, Whoa, you just typed in words and it animates. Um, and so we were doing it. I remember we had to like, you know, we had a projector and a screen, and you and we, so all the words are on a wall as like they're presenting. And one kid did some experiment involving like water buoyancy and corks, but two or three times he had typoed cork into cock, <laughs> and that was ha- that was how that was how that's how Mr. Comiskey would would laugh at it whenever it came up. Like he would just like it'd be like it'd be like and the buoyancy of the cock, and he'd be like bah. <laughs> he'd start laughing and then we'd laugh with him because we were think like we could see it coming and we knew yeah. it was funny. But the fact that he laughed was almost like, yeah, it's this is funny. Because there are teachers that would not have laughed. There are teachers who are like, come on, everybody, come on, come on. Or like, or like, you know, like, I need you to fix this. Like, what's wrong with you? And to him, it wasn't like, it was like, oh, it's a typo. Yeah. It's, you know, you did the experiment. All of the science that you've done as a student is good. Um, yeah, you made a funny mistake that all of us think is funny. Why are we going to like hide it under some weird like makeup of proper actions in the sixth grade do you get a sense that this was a thoughtful decision on his part that this was methodological or that this is just kind of who he was i don't know um i think a, a lot of it is it's who he was because there had been once or twice where his his son ended up going to columbia so when i was in new york he'd like visit every so often and we'd oh. get like lunch or we'd get dinner maybe every 
four years. So you saw this guy. I saw this well guy. through life. Yeah. This is, oh, that's interesting. Okay. Um, we we kept in touch, like you know, um, uh, and I think it was ju- it was part of his personality, but I think it was also a choice to be really. Just to just be there for students in a way intellectually that a lot of teachers weren't. You so, know, I don't think like if my if I was for if I was like an abused kid, I don't know if he was the teacher I'd go to to be like, hey, I'm abused. Like, could you help me? But if I was like, you know, someone I wanted to like just talk to and joke around with, he was the teacher I wanted to hang out with, and he sort of taught me the value of like, just you know, not being funny to, like to cause a disruption, not being funny to. Um, to call attention to oneself, but almost being funny because that makes your life a little better. So he taught you emotional lessons. He taught yeah. you social lessons. He taught you lessons on humor. Yeah. And you're a professional humorist. I'm now. a professional humorist, yeah. Was he the beginning of that? I don't know if he was the beginning of that, but he was definitely like, you know, like if if I was doing a positive version of like Pink Floyd's The Wall, he was definitely a good brick in that wall. <laughs> you know, like as a kid, like I like comedy and like we yeah. go on long road trips because, you know, in Florida, everything's a road trip. Yeah. So like everything's listen- far from everything else. Exactly. Right. It's like a series of little city states divided by by alligators. Exactly. Yeah. So like and my parent and my dad would play like, you know, music and he'd also once in a while put on stand up albums. And those even as a very little kid, those were always my favorite parts mm-hmm. of like the audio portion of our road trips. So he wasn't the found the very, very base foundation, but he was definitely a very important part that was like, oh, you can be funny. It's also not something that people in movies do. Did he teach you any science? He did teach me science. Right. He was a great science teacher. Um, he, he, we, we all did um, a field trip with a bunch of teachers, but he sort of was like the head of it to the um, to the Keys, and we did snorkeling in the coral reef around the Keys. And he was like the one who led it. And I wow. remember, yeah. Yeah, and like we'd play. We you were out play. snorkeling in the Keys. No out kidding. snorkeling in the Keys. Do you have to buy shark insurance, like as a, as a sixth grader, if you go snorkeling in the Keys? I don't. Rem- there must have been some safety paperwork that like I have no idea about. We like you. The only sharks that we came across were like nurse sharks, which uh-huh. are absolutely harmless. Right. Yeah. Unless you go like step on one, they're not going to bother. You. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was like this super positive experience. Um, we also, for some reason, started a rumor that he was having an affair with another teacher um, why did you do that because we because all of the boys were in love with this one teacher so i think we sort of mapped out our love for this woman uh onto him and like we did it as a bit with him and i think like this was also the dawn of like instant messenger where like we'd like instant message him like about this bit and he'd be like you guys need i'm at home with my wife stop yep. stop messaging me that i'm having an affair <laughs> with miss edgington <laughs> He's sitting there just watching his life flash in front of his <laughs> eyes. Like, he's trying to be cool for you. Like, I can't scare them, I can't, but yeah. I'm going to get fired well, and never work again. It's not even phones. It's like when you had one computer in your house, oh. and, like, it'd be like, Bruh! like, you yeah. know, and everyone would be like, oh, there's a message on the computer. Yeah. Let's all go see what it is. Um, but even, like, then, he addressed it almost like we were, like, his coworkers. Like, if we were, like, you know, yeah. at a company that was fun, like, you know, it was never like, you guys, come on, we, we've talked about this. Um, like, you know, when, when kids did something wrong or like there was an emergency, he was, he was a teacher. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't like a garbage person that way, but he, he made us always feel like we were on his level and he was on our level. So he was very much your teacher. Yeah. But he taught you in mature ways. Exactly. Or, yeah. or, or in, in comprehensible, relatable in, ways. In comprehensive, relatable ways. And also in ways where, you know, we knew that he was our teacher and, you know, we had to pass this class and we had to do the work that he assigned yeah. us and we had to learn things, but also in a way that was like, you know, uh, also in a way that was almost like you wanted to be him. Mm-hmm. You know, you you were like, oh, if I if I you know I if I do these things that you're telling me to do, maybe I'll be more like you, somebody I respect. Okay. Now you're now you literally right now your job is writing uh, for a science show. And That's right. The show before that, which yeah. for, you were for Bill Nye. I worked for Bill Nye. Have words you written on a page come out of Bill Nye's mouth? I have written words that have uh, Bill Nye has said it and have made Bill Nye laugh. I've made Bill Nye laugh. That's. That's kind of everything you, you could that, want in That's life, all you it? could ever want. That's spectacular. You made Bill Nye laugh. The first time I did it, I felt so special. So do you feel a, an affinity for science? Did you as a child and do you now? I do. I was really into Bill Nye. I was really into Beekman's world. Um, oh, I remember Beekman's world. Yeah, that's yeah, funny. yeah. I, I always loved science. I always wanted to be, like when I was a little kid, like magician, scientist, like, you know, when you when you don't know that jobs have specialties. Yeah. I mean, there's no specialty in magician, but you know what I mean? Like, uh, I was like, you know, when there's like fireman, magician, scientist, doctor. Yeah. Um, I, I, I always thought that being a scientist would be really cool, but I never like... I got to a certain point and I was like, oh, I'll be a computer scientist. Yeah. And then I started learning programming and I was like, oh, I'm very bad at this. <laughs> I'm very, very You're bad, bad at this. I'm t- I was terrible at it. I'm a terrible o- programmer. Also, we had the opposite of a good teacher in our oh, high school programming class. So oh. it, that didn't help. Who's the worst teacher you ever had? The worst teacher I ever had. Um, the worst teacher I ever had 
there's two worst teachers. One meant very well, but it was Florida public school. So it was a public school, yeah. but she was very religious, which is fine. This was my third grade teacher whose name I actually don't remember, okay. but we don't, we don't she made us name. watch the movie Ghost four or five times. And every time we'd watch it, she goes, by the way, this is real. Like, so, Wait, you're watching Ghost in third grade? Yeah. Okay. So, so she was basically like a, a sexual kind of weird horror movie, but she was like so religious that she believed like she was like, this is basically the way the afterlife works. So she was trying to instill yeah. like like theological spiritualism. Right. And, and she talked about like through Whoopi Goldberg and Sam Wheat. Yeah. And she was a nice teacher. But as far as like what you're learning, she was a bad teacher. Ditto. Um, um, ditto. Yeah. Wow. Ditto. Okay, yeah. Ditto. There we go. Uh, ditto. That's amazing. Uh, what, who's, the, who's the other one? Uh, the other one was a teacher in uh, maybe 11th grade. She was my chemistry teacher. And she just didn't like being a teacher. Uh, she she often like would fabricate things students had done wrong. Like I was valedictorian in my high school, but she would like make up like for, for one, one time she like made up me like she, she, I went to a school that was mostly black and she like made up this thing that I called her the N word. Wow. And she oh did it God. like and she did like and she would do things like like another like time she like said that two students were having sex in her class and she was like I saw them having sex and they like weren't even dating and everyone she knew that they didn't like each other. She would engineer this stuff? She was so angry that she would make up these situations and like and it never really stuck because she did it so much that the administrators knew that she had this reputation for doing this sort of thing and they like were fortunately kind of like understanding they were like these are good students who have good grades and good backgrounds and have not been in trouble up to 11th grade i don't see why now is the point when they would crack like and she wasn't my only by far my only black teacher i had a lot of black teachers so you know when she said it, it was also like this thing where i was like almost like clenched up inside where I was like, I didn't, but this could, this is the end of me here. Like I would have to go to a different school. Um, and it was just this like weird, bitter game she had. And like, that's extraordinary. And she would like leave out parts of the curriculum cause they were different. Like she was a chemistry teacher and she would, there'd be things that we were supposed to do mm -hmm. in like the book. And she'd be like, ah, it's just a lot of work. Huh. And so, um, she was kind of the opposite of that cause she was, humorless and she was angry and she also had this way where i think that it was almost a mode of control where if she could like you know sort of stamp down people that was her controlling her own misery in that job and she had been a teacher for like decades and decades and decades and you know it, she wasn't very well liked by the administrator she wasn't well liked by the students she was just sort of this like you know person who must have just felt very very trapped in her position in life which is sad but yeah. she sort of took it out on us that's extraordinary well yeah. let's uh, let's pivot back then and, and talk a little bit about the virtues in addition to the the fact that he was willing to connect with you socially right. uh, at, at a level that you're actually IMing back and forth from home right. you mentioned he brought his family into your life what was that yeah. like um his family was they were like much younger they were well, I mean his wife was his age but yeah. his, his kids were like you know i'd say like maybe like Let's see. I want to say maybe like four or five years younger than us. So, okay. you know, like first grade, second grade. Um, we once played street hockey at his house and someone like accidentally, not hard, but like hit his daughter with the puck. And I, one of my, it made us laugh so hard because he goes, hey guys, I just want to let you know, you almost hit my truck with that puck. And it was so funny in that <laughs> moment. <laughs> It was such a funny thing. Like, like we all died laughing because it was like he got super serious and he delivered yeah. it perfectly. That's great. How many of you were there that he kind of took under his wing like this? I'd say probably like eight or nine. Okay. And and the thing is, like, whenever I recount it, there's always like this weird, I feel like an adult, there's this, people are like, well, like, was he like weird or something? They're like, no, it was so on the level um, that, I don't know, it was, so, it was so cool. And like, he brought his kids because he was like, you know, these are my kids. Like, this is my life. Like, he wanted us to know that he was a person. That's cool. You know, I think that a lot of teachers, and, you know, maybe it works for some teachers, want to be like, I'm a teacher. Yeah. I'm a teacher. You know, like, I'm a police officer. That is it. And I think for him, in his mind, he was like, if you know I'm a person, you're going to know that I want you to learn these things for a reason, not just because this is a paycheck to me. That makes sense. And there's more than one effective pedagogy, and this one's right. a great way to teach you about humor and relationships and probably exactly what the person you described to me needed at that moment. Exactly, yeah. So you only had him as a teacher for one year. One year, yeah. Uh, what was that last day of class like? You know what? I genuinely don't remember. Okay. But the nice thing is uh, the school was it was relatively like an open school so like you know we went to hang out with him on lunch breaks like okay. we like the last day was i don't remember it but i do remember seventh and eighth grade 
seeing him around you so know you like come back. Okay. yeah you go for lunch and like you talk to his new students and like and i think that also was a benefit to his students because like older students would come back and they'd be like you know happy to see him and they'd be excited and then like you know now if like you know i'm 32 if someone's 34 it's no age difference but yeah. when you're 12 and someone's 14 that's a giant gulf oh yeah that person has lived like 14 percent more life than you exactly. have at that point yeah it's tremendous and yeah. so like you know we'd see older students come back and love him and his younger students would see us come back and love him and i think it created again like a bigger community of like oh this person is worth listening to it's worth uh hearing what he has to say it's worth participating and he's somebody who you want to be like and his kid went to college. You went to Columbia? He went to Columbia. I went yeah. to NYU. Oh, you went to NYU, but you were both there in New York. Okay. Right. So, I, yeah. so you would look up his kid, go say hi, yeah. and then you'd see him again. Yeah, he'd visit his kid. When's the last time you saw him? Uh, maybe a couple years ago. I think his kid was graduating Columbia while I was, uh, I, w- I want to say while I was at Fallon, but I c- it could have been maybe when I was visiting New York one time. I'm okay. not sure, but it was a couple years ago his kid was graduating Columbia. And I, what, I, I didn't see the graduation, but he came by and he's like, hey, let's get, let's get lunch. And we got lunch and it was really cool. Is he still teaching? Uh, he's now uh, an administrator, I believe. Uh, I think bum, he, bum, bum. Yeah, I think he now like helps run magnet schools, although I could be mistaken. Yeah, every time you say magnet school, I get tickled. I had a friend that when I uh, lived up the street, my best friend growing up, yeah. and he went to a magnet school. Uh, and when I found out he was going to start going to the new, I thought it was Magnum School. <laughs> And, yeah. I, I did, and, and I had just seen Dirty Harry around that same yeah. time, and so I didn't really under – it was conflated in my head. But yeah. I, I, I figured it was – I thought it was maybe a school with guns, but I wasn't sure what that meant. Right. So my school definitely had some guns, okay, but yeah. it wasn't like the purpose of it. No, you weren't drawn there for that. You for weren't the drawn there for it. So, yeah. Ah, school with guns. Yeah. School with guns. Yeah, I, I, I lived in uh, North Carolina later on, so it was like a, you know, a gun rack school. Like, oh, absolutely. Uh, it was, yeah. it was, uh, it was the, the guns were there in the back of the pickup when you got there. Right. Uh, I, I imagine you're talking more about an in the locker, in the pocket kind of. In locker, in the pocket. Um, I was never really affected. I only had a gun pulled on me once in high school, mm-hmm. and you know, nothing really happened. I, I basically like gave him some money I had on me. Yeah. And that was, was it. Like, someone's I, pointing a gun I, I was I was mugged by a student I didn't know. Because also my high school was massive. It had thousands of students. So there was a lot of people I just didn't know. Okay. Um, but mostly it was, and this sounds weird to say as if it's a good thing, but it was mostly gang violence in the sense that like, I was not in a gang, so I nobody had a beef with me. You were a civilian. I was a civilian. I was okay. outside of it. I was not messing with anybody. I was actually pretty well liked. That's the other weird thing is I, you know, had some bullying stuff. You know, as we all do, but it was never as intense, I think, as it would have been in like a, tr- you know, traditional like movie, you know, Sweet Valley High type high school because th- there's not that we didn't have that stratification of like those are the jocks, those are the cheerleaders, those are the nerds, those are the goths. Like everyone sort of interacted. The people who had beefs with each other tended to like have very specific partisan reasons that weren't defined by like generations of you know, what club you were in. Weird social structure. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Something very different. Did you ever steal any uh, jokes from uh, from your teacher? Anything Anything any that's ever made it into your material? No, no, I wish. Because that I, hockey puck thing's pretty good. I wish. Uh, I, I, God, I wish I had something that good. Like, I think, like, maybe, like, tone, like, tone-wise and, like, poise. Yeah. Like, maybe I've picked up some of his, like, physicalities and the way of telling something, but not word for word. Has he ever seen you perform? Uh, online, yes, he's like seen YouTube videos. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So, and so you guys still keep in touch? We still keep in touch, like on Facebook. Every so, like I'll comment on his, you know, wall post. He'll comment on mine once in a while. We'll send messages. Oh, I hope you send him this. Let him know. I mean, I, you've yeah. already let him know, but yeah, uh, it, it makes me ex- it makes me happy. Um, you know, sometimes these stories, I, I never quite know where they're going to go. Yeah. So sometimes we're talking, and then it goes to, and then he died tragically. Right. Of like, and, and, and I'm always like, oh no, oh no. Right. Yeah. But it's and now he's happily administrating magnet schools, continuing to bring educational bliss to another generation of students. Yeah, so, yeah. Good. I'm glad for that. They can keep watching and see what you're doing in this exciting and, and amazing life you're living. Yeah, like, I've been I mean, very lucky. I've been very fortunate. Well, you've been fortunate, but you've also you've been, you know, what's uh, what's the old uh, the old adage? Our luck is is often other people. I yes. Think it was. Uh, yes. Of all people, I think Robert Heinlein who said that my luck is usually other people. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, the the help that people like him give you. And also you, I think you, you kind of worked your butt off too. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely, I definitely worked really hard too. Um, but that's, I mean, you know, you all, you know, we all work in, you're doing this, like everything that we do is like, 
luck plus hard work plus hope somebody sees the right thing at the right time yeah. and then passes it to a friend who passes it to a friend. Oh, yeah. You can do everything right and fail. Yeah, like, absolutely. absolutely. That's, people yeah. work very, that's part of the myth of hard work. Like, yes, it's good to work hard, but it doesn't mean you're going to make it. Right. It doesn't mean you're going to succeed in what you try. Right. And there's some people who are lazy who make it just because they had even more luck than we did. Are you saying it's not that simple? It's not that simple. <laughs> but helping other people does help. And that's kind of what this uh, silly little show is about is pointing out the, the little differences that others make in our lives. So thanks for sharing that story. Of course. Really yeah. Appreciate it. Happy to. I'm going to take a moment here to thank uh, some other people who helped this show happen, specifically our Patreon producers, Nick Ray and uh, Robert Nieder, uh, both of whom uh, give generous contributions to help make this show possible. And all of you out there who give on Patreon and also uh, all of you who subscribe to the Pockets Full of Soup Facebook group, who subscribe on YouTube, at all, etc. Yes, I realize it's all one blend of words that's just one sound of blah, 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 Charlie Brown parent at this point maybe but right. really I think I mean it every time thank you so much I, I really appreciate it and now we're going to shift gears to that second part of the show the very exciting and aptly named instant noodles uh, the lightning round yes and if I can get my questions to pop up on my phone here I usually use a notebook and I've lately endeavored to enter this this century with uh and that's proved to be a mistake most of the time <laughs> because I then I, I go through situations like this where I'm talking awkwardly. No. Mike Drucker, you're funny. Please say something funny on demand uh, while I look for this. Hey, guys. I can't see you, but I, I, I assume you're all attractive people, especially the Patreon people. Donating money to this show uh, makes you more attractive physically and emotionally to others. Wow. So, I, man. Is I, that helpful? I, 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 is that helpful I think I you? need to start giving to my own show. I want to look prettier. <laughs> So I, uh, I'm in this weird situation right now. So for mo, you know, I, I was not a bad looking kid. I've never been yeah. handsome, um, but I got, I got heavy uh, very quickly uh, past high school and yeah. it just ballooned, and then have been overweight my entire adult life. I'm losing a lot of weight right now. Oh, that's and great! For Congrats! The, for, thank you very much. It's a long road. I've yeah, got a course. long way to go still, but I just hit a really important threshold where I'm, I'm light, significantly lighter than I've been in my adult life. Great! And now I'm in this weird place where I, I, I'm not pretty, but I look better than I've looked right, yeah. when I see myself. And I'm like, I don't know what to do with this. Right, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, I mean, I, I ain't going to win no beauty contest. Right, but, no, yeah. And let me tell you about loose skin. But we'll move on from there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, let's start right here. Um, All right. One of our uh, user submitted uh, or community submitted questions, uh, user, listen to me, uh, the users, it's like Tron. The uh, they users. Are, they are gods. They rule us. Um, what is best sandwich? Best sandwich. Wow, that's a great question. Uh, I'm going to probably say, uh, top of my head, grilled cheese. Just Ooh. good grilled cheese is always good. Other sandwiches might be better at other times, but grilled cheese is always good. Okay, are you a grilled cheese butter on the outside or no butter? A butter on the outside. What kind of cheese? Uh, usually cheddar, like thick slices. Thick slices of cheddar. Uh, mayo or no? No. No mayo. So straight butter? Yep. Ch cheddar? Cheddar? That's it. Yeah. Thick uh, and thick bread slices too. Like I like that like good toasted like you gotta put a lot of work into it, but that good thick uh grilled cheese sandwich. Like like Japanese thick bread? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm, so good. Oh thick Japanese bread, so good. Yep. You ever done it with the iron? Like the yep. onion juice? Uh, not the iron, but I've definitely done like like a heavier press, like with like more complicated than just in the pan and flipping it. I've made them in a George Foreman. I made it in an awful or a w awful iron, uh, yeah. a waffle iron. There we are. Uh, a few times, and I have done the Benny and June thing just to see if it would work, and it does. So you can you can do it. Uh, what's the number one Christmas present you ever received? Oh, that's a good question. Um, number one Christmas present yeah, I ever one? received. Yeah, what's the best Christmas present? It's a new one. This is the first time we're asking this. It's hard to, it's hard because most of the Christmas presents I've asked for have been things like games and like books. So I've never had like a big one. I do think, you know, I, it seems very cliche, but I definitely got a bike one year that I used for like five years. Oh. And I, and it sort of, it wasn't something I asked for. It wasn't something I expected. And again, my parents have had, you know, when I was younger, my parents had a lot of financial trouble. So we never really expected big gifts. Uh, so a bike was a really nice surprise. And, you know, even though I was not a physically fit kid, because I, because I got, I got, I got overweight very early on. Like I was like very adorable kid until seven or eight, and then it was just like fat. Like it almost like it was almost like my body like got stung by bees, and it was suddenly just like big. But having that bike gave me this mobility, and I felt like even though I wasn't losing weight, I think I felt just a little more free from yeah. that body prison. Um, so that I think might have been the best one. 
That's exciting. Uh, what was it like biking in Florida? Because Florida is a is a it, it's a humid, horrible hellscape. But the nice thing is it's flat. There so go. so there's no hills and I mean there's hills, but like they're like like yeah. you know like biking in San Francisco would be a nightmare. But Florida was like you could go miles because you're not that tired from it. I just moved into this little residential neighborhood in in Redwood City. That's like the most suburban place I've been in in the Bay Area. Oh yeah, uh, I'm just in this little apartment there, and it, it, is, it is to the point of like almost sickening. It's like a Central Florida retirement community. Right. That's where I'm living now, and I really want to get one of those little low tricycles the old people in Florida ride around yeah. with the big flags. <laughs> You know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, I know exactly I, I'm what you're talking about. thinking about getting one of those to you ride should. around the neighborhood with a big basket on it. I, <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so the bike. Did you name your bike? No, I didn't. Okay, I wondered. Uh, yeah. Some people name their bikes. Some don't. Uh, I, I think I think I named my bike Excalibur. Excalibur's cool. I was I was five. So, was, <laughs> But uh, uh, what's the best song written in the last 100 years? Best song written in the last 100 years? These are good questions. These are silly. We're just uh, figuring are... people have an opinion on wow. them. Wow. You're very kind. Um, you're so nice about you're like oh that's oh that's so I, well because I don't want to be like oh it's the Beatles the um I'm trying the last I don't know if the Beatles years. wrote the best song in the last hundred years that's okay um I, I don't I don't know what the best song in the last hundred years I mean I keep you know to me like I always liked Weird Al stuff and I keep wanting to say something like Dare to Be Stupid by Weird Al but oh. that's not that's not the best song written in the last hundred years it's just what like. If it ever comes on, I like it's more like a favorite song than the best song. I find it very interesting that you went with a Weird Al original, not yeah. a parody. You went with you went Weird with, Al's originals are good. Yeah, Christmas at Ground Zero, Christmas and at Ground that, Zero, yeah. You Don't Love Me Anymore. Yeah, those are good songs. So, so are you gonna are you gonna double down on it? I'm gonna double down. I'm gonna say Dare to Be Stupid Dare by be Weird Al Yankovic. That I, I love you so much right now. Favorite flavor of ice cream? Favorite flavor of ice cream is strawberry. Ooh, okay. Any uh, any particular reason? Just, uh, um, I don't. I always liked it. I was always like, you know, like strawberry milkshakes. I think are better than chocolate or vanilla Ooh. milkshakes. I just like that. I know that it's not how strawberries actually taste, but the chemical strawberry flavor is very good to me. What's your favorite word? My favorite word, um, ichthyologist. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. So that, that, fish that, scientist. That's like that's like. You can do a lot in that. You can be a, a specialist in a Lovecraft novel. Yeah. Like, because half of them are fish monsters, so they right. always have to go find an ichthyologist and ask yeah. them a question. That's a great one. Why, why uh, where'd you stumble upon that word? Uh, I don't know. I think, like, when I heard it, it just it just has this weird sound to it. Like, if you're like, I'm an ichthyologist, you're like, okay. Like, it just sounds so interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, like, you know, there's also a really bad medical condition called harlequin ichthyosis. Don't Google image it because you won't like what you find. Um, it's a horrible skin condition uh, that basically when you're born with your skin inside out. But, I've like, I remember seeing that in middle school on, like, some site like Rotten.com, which is an old, oh, old gosh. reference. <laughs> old, remember re- remember Rotten.com? This is weird. This when is there the was, like, second, eight sites on the internet? This is the second mention of Rotten.com I've heard in two days. <laughs> Chris Antista was talking about Rotten.com the right. other day on, on Laser Time. Yeah. Uh, oh man. So, but yes, it was. Don't don't go don't go don't go, don't go to Rotten.com. Rotten.com. Don't Google image search Harlequinic theosis. I'm you won't like what you find. Yeah. Gosh, oh, I'd forgotten about that. Um, let's see. And you know they're gonna go do it. Now. Yeah, I know they are. I put so, it in their heads. Sorry, guys. It's the only thing that should be weeded out of the Internet Archive. Is <laughs> we just want to pretend that never happened. Uh, if you could travel to time and meet any one person, who would it be and why? Um, who would I meet? Maybe H.G. Wells. Ooh, wow. And I know that's an interesting answer with a time travel thing. That's not the reason, but I just think he was so ahead of his time and he was so creative that I want to be like, how did you think of things like, you know, because he created the modern idea of an alien invasion. Like, he, it's not the first idea of otherworldly beings coming to Earth, but our structural idea of what an alien invasion would look like, he started. Our idea of time machines, he started. Now, the con a concept of time travel he didn't invent but our idea of a time machine he invented um like the invisible man uh, a lot of his stuff that's lesser known that's like like post-apocalyptic stuff or dystopian societies he originated a lot of those ideas the way we see them today like he's almost the father of nerd pop culture yeah war of the worlds is 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 kind of the first oh wait the zombies are out there oh wait no the guy i'm trapped in here with is even worse right exactly exactly he he kind of invents that theme yeah Uh, and although they're not zombies they're giant alien tripods they're awesome they're great uh but oh yeah i love war of the Worlds. still good read it's such a great read it's also uh it's also like you know it's not written what i like about novels like that and like dracula i know dracula is a different author is that they're not like you know you know dracula is an epistolary novel it's just letters yeah you know, and nobody rem- nobody thinks about it. it's just like 
a novel of a guy writing letters about things that's happening to him. And like War of the Worlds is a reporter making a report on this thing. And those don't get written as much anymore. You exactly. Don't Actually, uh, here's time for a plug. But uh, on Patreon, uh, some of our uh, subscribers, I do a really stupid thing every month that's written in the same structure, a series of diary entries called uh, Pizza and Dinosaurs Presents the Thirst of Laser Dracula. Oh, wow. Which is about the adventures of Laser Dracula, the out-of-work DJ um, <laughs> who can shoot gnarly lasers from his eyes. And it's all written by – it's written in the same style because I love those old stories. Right. And and uh, so that's – now I'm plugging it. Uh, it that's for uh, people that give it a certain level on Patreon. If you want to read that, I read it as a sort of an audio novel every month. Yeah. Um, if looking better is not enough for you. If you don't want to just look and feel better by donating. Can, yeah. Sorry. Man, novel. I'm plugging a lot today. No, 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 no. But that's... it's not often Dracula comes up like, wait. Wait a minute. Right. And let me tell you, it's stupid. It's a dumb story. <laughs> There, there's a mummy that can only speak an old text adventure parser. I there's love that. A, yeah, it's that's it's so dumb. cool. Um, there's a convenience store that's very important for some reason. Uh, yeah, it's 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 dumb. Uh, let's see. Uh, what's the first word you think of when you hear the sound of your own voice? Um, sh- shrill. <laughs> I don't like my voice. I don't like how it sounds. I never have. Um, I always cringe when I hear it. Who was your first kiss? Who was my first kiss? Um. There was, uh, it was when I was five, there was a girl who lived across the street named Diane. I don't know what her last name is, or Diana. Uh, the memory of it's weird. You know, like when you like remember like both things happening at the same time? Yeah, sure. So it was either Diane or Diana, and like, I guess she was technically my first girlfriend in the sense that like I had a crush on her, we hung out, and we kissed a couple times, and we definitely like played doctor, but like she led, she was two years older. Um, guys, uh, so she like, you know, taught me the ropes as much as a seven year old would teach the five year old the ropes. But yeah, she was my first kiss. Uh, sad story when she, her parents moved and I kept stealing the moving sign under the impression that if there was no moving sign, they couldn't move. That's, that's really sad, isn't it? (laughs) Awkward and sad in so many ways. (laughs) Like I was like, well, if they don't have a moving sign, no one will know they're moving. (laughs) What's uh, or for sales on you know what I mean? Yeah, the ways you think you can affect the world when you're a kid. Yeah, sometimes you think you just don't understand how things work. Right. Uh, it's uh, it's just like oh wait, I must just not get this yet. Right. Exactly. That's a feeling that as adults we maybe we ought to remember more. Yeah. I, I felt more like that lately. The last the last few months, I kind of feel like that's happening to me in the whole world. And yeah. I don't know if that's just the onset of dementia or right or if it's just the world got weird. Yeah, or changing what. world. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Our brain's dying. Maybe that's what it is. <laughs> um. For me, you you've uh, done marvelous things that Thank many you. people uh, uh, you know would dream about doing or be very curious about doing. Um, advice for people that want to make a humor a part of their everyday life, whether, whether or not they're making their paycheck from it. How do you, how do you uh, how do you advise people weave humor into their lives? Because it, it's your bread and butter, but it right. also seems to be a part of who you are. How do how do you make that happen? Um, you make other people feel like they're funny. Uh, and I don't mean like just laugh like at awkward times, but like if someone's trying to tell a joke, make them feel like they're funny, like be generous with your humor. And I know that sounds weird, um, but when you're generous with it, other people will think you're funny too. Like always try to like, you know, find humor in situations. Don't try to uh, hurt people that aren't trying to hurt you with humor. If someone's trying, if someone's trying to hurt you and you have a good comeback, fine i know that maybe that's not the best advice but like don't don't like just try to hurt others or or do it cynically because that's not really humor it's just sarcasm um and as far as weaving into your life you know just be open and sort of let your mind wander make connections in your mind you know puns are connections jokes are connections they're unexpected connections Mm. uh so a lot of it's just keeping your eyes, ears, and mind open to different connections in life. And that's where a lot of humor comes from, when two things that are connected but you don't expect it connect. Can you give, a, can you give an example of that, something that, that comes to mind? Um, I'm tr- no, no, man, follow-up questions. Oh, uh, sorry. No, 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 don't be sorry. Um, you know, okay, uh, I'll, I'll give an example because I'll give an example for one of my favorite monologue jokes I wrote while I was at Tonight Show, which is... Um, you know, uh, some politician, I forget who, was like found to be friends with some mafia boss named Joey No Socks. And I was like, or as he's also known, Joey Easy Christmas Present. And the reason I like, <laughs> and the reason I like that joke is because 
you know that it's a mafia name for some reason like he he killed somebody without wearing socks but then you're like oh he's got no socks that's an easy christmas present and it's that connection of like no socks is in like sort of like a mafia style name but also the idea of like someone who doesn't have any socks what would you get them that's, that's a really good joke <laughs> i was very proud of that joke when i wrote that joke What's a, following up again? I, I don't want to get yeah, too no, no, far no, down okay. the down the back room of the, of the right or the writers' room rabbit yeah. uh, hole. But what's it like on a dry day when you come in and it, and it ain't flowing? Is, is do, you, do you go through periods where where you feel yeah. like it's not not happening? I mean, you you come in days when you know you just had a fight with the person you're dating, or you know, you know, my grandma's been sick the last few months, so that's been hard and it's at the back of my head, or you know. There was just a school shooting, and you have to make a show because that's what you do. I mean, when I was at a late night show, you know, you still have to say something or do something, and you're like, do you say nothing, or do you, you know, do you address it very somberly, or do you ignore it because people don't want to hear about it anymore? And those days are hard. A lot of it's just you have to move forward. It's like any job when you're in a bad mood, you still have to do that job, um, and that's a lot of what being a comedy writer is. Y- you know, it's anyone can be funny once in a while. You know, anyone, like, if you look, read, you know, Reddit comments or YouTube comments, there's always somebody who's probably not a professional comedy writer who wrote the funniest thing you've read all day. Because mm-hmm. everybody has a moment where they make that connection that we're talking about. When you're a comedy writer, though, it's about an en- the endurance to do it all the time. Even when you don't want to, even when you think there's nothing funny about that situation, even if, like, you know, you disagree with the premise politically, but you still have to, like you know, make that connection because you're expected to hit both sides like I was for The Tonight Show, which is, you know, fine. That's a fine philosophy and I'm okay with that. But like, then you have to be like, okay, what would someone who disagrees with everything I think say, but also in a way that's not just like me making fun of them indirectly. You know what I mean? Like a joke that would make the other side laugh, not cynically. That's really helpful. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that. Of course. uh, It seems like a difficult, fascinating way to live your life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's, 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 when I say it's a job, I don't mean that I'm ungrateful for it, but there are times when I'm like, you know, I'll wake up and I'm like in a bad mood or I'm sick and I'm like, no, I have to, this is how I pay rent. Must make humor. Must make humor. (laughs) Gotta make the donuts. Time to make the donuts. Yeah. Makes sense. All right. This is where we separate the, uh, the, the men from the boys. Yep. Cake or pie? Cake. Cake easily. Cake, cake, cake. This guy. Pie, pie, pie's fine. Pie's pie's good. If but, someone has but pie's funnier. You hit somebody in the face with a cake, it's not funny. You hit somebody in the face with a pie. Hitting someone with a, with a with a pie is funnier than hitting someone with a cake, but falling into a cake is funnier than both. Okay. It's like like if someone falls off a skateboard into a cake. Very Especially funny. if it's a big wedding cake. If it's a big wedding cake, falling into a wedding cake is always funny. Yeah, that's true. That's very, very good point. Wow. Unless, like, something really tragic. <laughs> Unless there was, like, an earthquake and everyone's dead. Not as good. Then it's not as good. Otherwise, as good. pretty funny. Pretty funny. Uh, just last one here real quick. I was asking us at the end. This is uh, the, the moment of narcissism. Anything you want to ask me? Um, how are you doing? I'm okay. Uh, I just moved. Good. Uh, which is terrifying and exhausting. Yeah. Uh, I'm in a new neighborhood doing a, a new job that's really interesting. Yeah. And I'm learning all kinds of neat new stuff that I didn't know before. And yeah. So I'm still kind of in that, whoa. Like yeah, stage yeah. Uh, of things. Um, my wife's about to start her second semester of grad school. That's all. Uh, oh, that's came awesome. Out of the first semester with straight A's. She's really excited. Yeah. Um, and uh, she's working hard on that. Life is really, really busy right now. Yeah, I'm of course. Tired, and I want to nap. And yeah. There's no time to take one. Yeah. Uh, that's how I am right now. Well, um, I'm making an effort since I moved to a different part of town to keep doing fun things with people. Moriarty right. and I are having dinner uh, oh, later cool. this week. I'm joining a D&D group. You know, oh, that's great. Things like that. So, but uh, actually Star Wars D6. But anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, got to get the, you got to get those qualifiers. Out. Yeah. Anyway, uh, that's how I'm doing. Thanks for asking. Yeah, of course. Kind of you. And thank you for being on, Mike. And folks know, you know, again, what should they be watching? If they want to hear your words coming out of other people's mouths. Um, watch Bill Nye Saves the World coming to Netflix this spring, probably March or April. Uh, Adam Ruins Everything. Uh, the next season comes out this summer, probably July or August. I'm on Twitter at Mike Drucker. I'm also on Twitch at Mike Drucker. Uh, Instagram, Mike Drucker is dead. Mike Drucker was taken. Um, so, yeah, you can follow me all those places. I'll announce stand updates. Um, I also have my podcast, How to Be a Person, where me and my roommate, uh, Jess Dweck, try to stop being social cripples by help by getting our friends to teach us things. And I also do a podcast about Hamilton called The Room Where It's Happening. If nothing else, uh, if you don't follow Mike already, you need to go to his Twitter feed just to read his pinned post, which is the all-time best pinned post joke. Thank you. In the Twitterverse. Thank you. That's it, very nice yeah. of you. There's no hyperbole there. It's the 
best joke on Twitter. Thank, that's really so, cool of you. Thank really you very good. much. Um, so, and thank you, Mike, for coming on. I appreciate you doing this. Of course. Uh, so, guys, uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, look forward to hearing from you. That's mail at pocketsfullofhoop.com. If you want to just say you're thankful for somebody, uh, let us know somebody you want us to give a shout out to. Try to keep the messages short if you can, just so I can get them read on the air, and uh, we'll get into those. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.